Okay, hello everyone and welcome back to our discussion. So in the last video, I gave you a self-introduction. In this video, we'll start discussing scenario planning right away, which is our core concept of this global youth program by Wilder University. So the credit of this is same thing to S. Malik. Professor S. Malik is the director of this course on scenario planning. Along with, I will also want to give credit to Oliver Baxter and Aaron Cowley. They are two tech uh, speakers who has influenced me in on the process of scenario planning. Okay, and here I put the address of the university. Okay, now let's start right away. Why do we do scenario planning? It is the fundamental question when we get to scenario planning. And the reason is, so first of all, I want to say who invented it. So it's invented by American futurist of the 20th century, Herman Cain. And why do we do scenario planning? The reason is just like what well, you can infer from the words to predict the trend of the future and tackle them with actions. So you know, as it is inspired actually by the COVID-19 pandemic, the COVID-19 has made huge changes in our society. The society is altering fast. Um, different countries in the world are experiencing problems, social problems, economic problems, political issues. That's why we have to predict the trends. We find out that when there is uncertainty, when there are uncertainties, it's pretty hard to cope with these uncertainties. For instance, you know, many businesses do fail in COVID-19. Many, um, many countries are kind of experiencing a kind of economic depression. And now I want to hold you for a second. The our goal is not to eliminate these failures because it isn't possible. Although we want to apply scenario planning for businesses, but we will not uh, forecast every single thing correctly. That's magic. That's not going to happen in reality. In reality, what we try to do is to predict the trend so we can take suitable actions so we can change our business models, we change how our business work in the market for a long amount of time so we can ensure that our business in the long run can be, can be survived, can survive our business in the long run, can be stable. That's our goal. Every business will at some point of time experience some failures such as the COVID-19, but there are also some ways to avoid it. Although we can't avoid all problems caused by this pandemic, but we're able to tackle some of these problems if we have applied scenario planning, which some businesses actually did. So to predict the trend is our goal and tackle them with suitable actions, tailor-made actions. And our second goal is basically to make assumptions on what the future is going to be and how your business environment will change over time in light of the future. For instance, how will the consumption of the customers change? How will your business models change? How are your human resources going to be altered? How are your way of selling be changed? Will you move your business more to an online channel rather than a physical, physical uh, brick and mortar physical stores, corner stores? How will internet platforms shape your business? How will artificial intelligence replace certain workforce, workforce of your company, of your market? How will market competition change? These are really important factors to consider, as well as how will government regulations affect your businesses. So we have a lot of questions to consider when we do this scenario planning, and we'll discuss them later on. For example, when we link it to COVID-19 pandemic, one question we can ask is how the COVID pandemic change the future. We are not discussing about how will the trend of COVID-19 go, such as more people will get the virus. Of course, this is important, but if we focus on the long run, our question will be, what will this pandemic unleash? So unleash means how will this pandemic cause some, cause some problems after it's unrestrained? Which means after this virus is kind of getting lighter, lighter, after this virus kind of eliminates our society, how will the pandemic unleash? This means how will, for example, the workforce change? Maybe some companies, as I, I talk with some Watson, Watson students, and some Watson students believe that they think the pandemic will create a more work at home trend because some companies such as those tech businesses or my medical or I would say technology or internet service businesses find out that sometimes work at home can be highly effective compared to work in office. So in this case, many businesses may consider to move some jobs that can be work at home at home. Therefore, they can save a lot of time and kind of cooperate well while saving rental fees as well. Moreover, there can be also trends in businesses. For instance, e-voting. We had mail-in ballots when we vote, like in the United States, when uh, some person, for instance, an embassy, where a person lives in China can vote for the US president. But if there's a certain pandemic, will e-voting be implemented? And how will this affect other aspects, for instance, internet banking? 
Now, although internet is popular in advance, we don't have many businesses conducting internet banking yet at the moment. We have businesses' websites for banks, banks have websites, but some banks, for example, some banks are, for my research on Taiwan banks, I see a bank that actually uses internet banking to actually decide on how much long to borrow to a particular client and how, and they tailor-made derivative products, they tailor-made finance products, finance instruments, investment products, Tailor, they tailor their loans for students, for couples, for entrepreneurs, for old people, for retirement age people. So they're able to kind of tailor made certain products for individual customers. So this is also a trend that I will see the pandemic unleashes. Okay. And if we look at this quote, three quotes here, I want you guys to uh, know to get started, to get started on scenario planning. The first one is that the task is not so much to see what no one else has yet seen. But to think what nobody has yet thought about, the which everyone has seen. This means our goal is not to see that no one else has seen. If, because sometimes as a trend, it's pretty hard that no one has seen a trend. So everybody's working towards a certain trend. Therefore, what we're thinking is what nobody has yet thought about that everyone has seen. For instance, technology. Everyone has seen technology. Everyone knows technology is advanced. Everybody now uses Instagram, uses Facebook, they know technology is event. But everybody sees technology, but they never thought about certain trends of technology that may influence the business environment, that may influence the particular market you are in, that may influence the particular industry you are in as well. So this is the important part is to actually analyze and make predictions on certain trends, on certain factors, on certain products, on certain uh, elements that everyone actually has already seen. This makes sense because the first sentence is that Arthur Schopenhauer, the German philosopher, gives does not make sense. If no one else has seen anything, it is not really a future trend. It will be something that may come out in the future, but it's not a trend. It means large uh, It means highly probability. The high probability is that these things right here will not influence you so much. It will not influence your business so much because they will be more far away maybe 50 years maybe 75 years maybe 100 years but now we're focusing on years such as five years 10 years 15 years this trend actually emerged from some element that we are already seeing for instance technology for instance political regulations microeconomic forces for instance and online selling for instance and internet banking internet finance artificial intelligence those important factors to be taken into account I think the second quote is also interesting. The William Gibson says the future is already here, but it's just not evenly distributed. So I want to also correlate this quote to the third quote that actually talked about the same concept. The future is already here by Charles Handy. It's just not a uh, future is already here. It's just in smaller portions. So actually, if you guys imagine that actually everybody knows fu the future. For instance, in the future, some person from the Democratic Party will win the president. But the problem is, it's in smaller portions. That means we don't know whether Joe Biden will be the president. We know there may, we know that maybe next year will be Republican. Maybe, maybe still Donald Trump. Maybe in the next year, following the next year, will be Republican. But we know that highly probably, like it's probably highly probably that there will eventually be a president from the Democratic Party to win the U.S. presidency. We also know that AI will shape internet banking, but we don't know the details. That's why Charles Handy and William Gibson said it's not evenly distributed and it's in smaller portions. In smaller portions mean we may know technology may shape internet shopping. Maybe more and more people will use Amazon and physical stores will be closed down. But by how much will they close down? How much customers will be distributed online? How much of physical stores? We still don't know these details. That's why we can predict smaller proportions, but sometimes the smaller portions don't make sense unless we get some supporting details to support, to back up the smaller proportions. So that's, that's why we believe the future is actually here. We are, future is not something that we have to wait for. It's actually built on our present environment. But as long as, as long as it goes, we are unable to predict the details of what's not happened yet. So this is an important thing that you guys should consider when you develop your learning in scenario planning. So the last sentence written by me, just correlate, it just corresponds to what I was saying that we are able to predict the future in smaller quantities such as global warming. Everybody knows eventually global warming will come. Everybody knows if we follow the same sequence, possibly, uh, possibly there's still global warming and we know there, there will be decreasing fertility. Many people know that. Geographists, learners know that. 
And uh, demographers know that. And decreasing fertility and inflation, we also know there will be inflation. We might know there is deflation. Inflation actually happens no matter it's being inflation or the or a or is it a bad inflation or good inflation, being or hyperinflation, you always come. So we know this. We know there will be inflation, but we don't exactly when will there be inflation and what regulations may be imposed to stop this regulation and how you will link to trade. So you can express and you can brainstorm many, many problems that follow decreasing fertility, that follow inflation, that follow global warming, environmental degradation. This means that's why I follow, I add this sentence behind that we can't predict the data set at the time, the range, which means where did it happen, how much people are affected, what are the industries that are affected, how well this industry changed its business model. And interconnected factors that hinge with particular phenomena. Hinge is like the door. When you, when, you have, when you see the door, it actually hinges together different metals. This means when something happens like inflation, we may predict that inflation may happen. Let's say someone predicts that October 2021 inflation for the United States. But however, once inflation has happened, there are many factors that hinges, they actually connected, they're interconnected with this particular phenomenon of inflation that we may not be able to predict. For instance, we know COVID-19 and everybody may predict that in, at some point of time there may be an infectious disease. After the Spanish flu, after SARS, after MERS, people may predict that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, there may be something like COVID-19. But even people, if people predict this, that we don't know what to take actions, we still will experience economic re uh, recession. I know this is unavoidable, but still, if we predict like five to ten years scale, in five to ten years scale, we might be able to solve some problems that hinge with a particular phenomenon. So just just in case inventory, other than just in just in just in, for instance, to replace just in time inventory with just in case inventory to store large staff or to automate your workforce spending some investments in order to resolve any potential issues that can be caused by this kind of a pandemic okay 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 now i want to introduce to you guys the core principles of scenario planning which can be broken down into three different principles the first principle is to take the long view what do you mean by taking the long view is to think five to ten years with a time bound for instance, you may want to consider the trend in at least 5 to 10 years. You have to talk about the huge impacts. Although it's going to impact your business, but usually what's impacted in your business will be impacted in the whole market. So you try to avoid that. So we have to consider the huge impacts, such as economic impact, technological impacts. You also have to examine the changes in business models. For instance, moving from normal multi-channel selling to omni-channel selling. Omnichannel basically refer to the customers are using a combination of the physical stores, which we call as a brick and mortar stores, and we use online stores to kind of assemble this process of buying, this B2C process. And changes in business models may also mean more internet business will emerge. Maybe it means manufacturing business will be automated. Maybe it can be as large as in the world financial market that more analyzed analyst, financial analysts in the fundamental level are no longer needed. Also, we had to examine the price technology's impact on businesses and lives. For instance, technology may play pros and cons in your life, but how will it impact our business? It's not only about the replacement of workflows, but it's also about, but it's not only about the workforce, but it's also about how can we apply technology to still gain profits? How will our workforce then be organized together? For instance, well, we require virtual teams like doing Zoom, kind of what we have think about what we have experienced during this pandemic, will that be taken into effect in the future? How can we prepare for that? How can we do talent search what we have to, uh, what we're developing our business model in more of a human resource structure around the world, what we are focusing on virtual teams? So there are a lot of factors that you have to consider that may sound easy, but it's hard to implement, especially when there's a current business model and there will be drastic changes when you have to switch and transfer your current model into a future model that is focused on technology. Okay. And also, moreover, you have to care about technology's impact on lives if your business is a non-profit business or is something that's working with the government. Government has multiple businesses and they have to care about people's lives. If technology will play an active impact, maybe government should make compromise. They should encourage business to make profit well. They should provide job opportunities, subsidies to those people who may lose, lose their jobs due to technology advancements. So there are a lot of questions to consider on different parties, different stakeholders, whether you're an investor, you may care about how do technology impacts businesses, so how so then you affect interdependently how do you have, how do you invest. 
and for definitely for companies it's definitely important as, as I mentioned before just now and definitely if you're a government organization if government officials or work in the public sector you may have to consider how well microeconomic forces help how should we shape it how should we compromise different parties between our society to kind of elaborate a balance of equilibrium benefits for those poor and for those rich to kind of try to lessen the wealth gap and lastly we also have to examine the political changes Political, political changes do affect our principles of a pre scenario planning. Sometimes politics, uh, politics do make a lot of regulations. Politics do affect some, uh, some different political parties, do affect their ideologies. Some parties do not want to reduce wealth gap. Some parties want. Some parties do not want economic uh, conservatism. Some companies want. Oh, sorry, some parties want. So fiscal conservatism, social conservatism, social liberalism, fiscal liberalism, you should consider that, and they can have a huge impact on the market due to the government's ideologies, government's regulations to assist their beliefs on how to shape a good society. Second principle is to use outlook in thinking. That means you are looking ahead. I want to use two different bullet points to state, to indicate what I want to express right now. The first thing is scenario planning is an art more than it is a science. Although you may say we are using scenario planning for practical purposes. What's the point? We don't hinge it with certain aspects. But the problem is we apply scenario planning because it is actually an art. What do I mean by art is not the fact that scenario planning may be individual and they may not be useful as a whole to the society or to a business. The meaning is, as I want to take a quote from a famous Dutch business executive, Eric de Gauss, the reliability of their content is less important than the types of conversations and decisions they spark. This means scenario planning, the content is isn't important. Like we, our goal is not to predict like 5% growth or 40% growth, that's uh, more of a technical aspect. But our goal is to predict when we are predicting and when we are brainstorming the future scenario, we will spark and we will kind of, uh, will kind of boost and render certain conversations and decisions, both for businesses and for, the bus and for the public sector, the government. For instance, when we are talking about technology's impact in internet banking, we may be talking about, or we might not be able to predict the content as of how will this be carried out. But we may be interested in the conversations and decisions that spark, for instance, for instance, what will be the regulations, what will be the business model, how will we serve the customers, is it B2C, how do we ensure we serve customers geographically. This means when you are doing scenario planning, you hope to see or you hope to spark out some ideas, so you use some outlook in thinking and try to think of scenario planning as an art because, it, because scenario planning is not a fixed way. If we want to draw scenario planning, it's like a rule, it's like a traffic light with a lot of rules. You can go left, you can go 45 degrees, you can go 90 degrees, you can go 180 degrees, you have a lot of roads to go. This means you have a lot of pathway to go, which means you have to construct different scenarios and think of this, think of how can you spark these ideas while you are dis developing these scenarios. What, so it's not really a science subject that you are kind of saying there's only one idea according to science. Okay, so hope you guys can get something from this. And the third perspective is to encourage multiple perspectives, the third principle. So I'm going to introduce the steep principle later on, the steep model. Later on, you are going to use that to focus interconnections between multiple factors. This is because many factors hinge together, just like I mentioned before. I just now talk about the political factors do hinge a lot of other factors, such as economic factors. But also the steep model, when we use steep model, we'll find out that actually all the factors are interconnected, the social factor, the technological factor, the environmental factor, political factor, and more and more. And the second thing I want to talk to you guys is we have to encourage views on the global scale. Because sometimes when we are encouraging multiple perspectives, we will see global, in a globalized society, countries do affect other countries. In terms of economic, in terms of development, in terms of cooperation. So this will also be linked a bit, little bit to politics, so we have to make interconnections between countries around the world and think of problems, think of certain trends in the global scale. And then we have to generate several scenarios and possibilities based on different based on different pathway I just mentioned here right now in the moment. Because when we are thinking of scenario planning it is actually an art. We have different pathways, we have different scenarios. There's no right and wrong answer. After that we try to construct possibilities and we try to make dig into more details once we've decided on a certain pathway and we try to decide to input all the de input details to all the pathway we brainstorm. And then also I want you guys to think in public and private perspective. You should think also about the government and private businesses while you are discussing about the future trends because they do intercorrelate or the, they do correlate to each other and they are actually interest groups. 
okay and lastly also micro and macroeconomic forces because they, these two economic forces are interconnected macro forces do determine how microeconomics will work and micro do determine macroeconomics will force as a government definitely cares about the uh, cares about economy as a nation but how do we develop the economy of a nation how do we develop economic growth is to start from individual markets to start from individual industry that's why both of macroeconomics are focused on nation as a whole and microeconomics are focused maybe on household maybe for market maybe for specific industry also work also is pretty important as well so hope you guys can memorize these three core principles and to be able to brainstorm what do these three principles mean and what do they indicate and refer to there's something that is essential that we may be we may need to take account to okay okay so now just to give you a simple example on considering while you're doing scenario planning for instance just imagine you are going on a holiday when we are going to a holiday you have to contemplate on a few destinations you won't hold a firm opinion on which particular country, city you are going to visit. You may consider the cost. You have to consider the weather, possibly. Maybe the feeling of your family, partners, and your health. Maybe the atmosphere, culture, distance, language barriers, consumption, time consumption, time taken, which is kind of linked to distance, safety, health, security, landscape, and attractions. So it's highly important that we have to key. Just like when we go to a holiday, we have to think about a lot of factors. Same thing for the future. When we think about the future, we also we mind just like holiday, we haven't decided which country should we go yet. In the future, we haven't decided on our business model yet. We haven't decided how well we work it. So our cost in this case may be the finance, the weather may be how well this atmosphere of the market work, maybe there's culture, how well the corporate culture change, how well the human resources organization change. So it's kind of linked to the holiday. Although this holiday example seems pretty childish, pretty common sense, but actually when we're doing scenario planning, we are doing something like holiday. For example, we are contemplating the cost of weather of a different country. For instance, the cost of Beijing, cost of Shanghai, cost of Singapore, cost of New York. Same thing, when you contemplate some new planning, you may consider the finance requirement for, uh, for technology development. You may consider the finance requirement for internet banking. You may consider the weather or the atmosphere of the technological market. You may consider the culture of the restaurant market. So it's kind of correlated one by one in this case. You okay, have to correlate that back to your scenario planning, back to your business, your industry, and your market. Okay, so here is just an example. And right now we have to go into we have to start on our step of scenario planning. It may be a little bit wordy, but I I think everybody have to pay attention. This is how we learn step of scenario planning effectively. This the idea is pretty easy, but I'm just providing multiple examples and multiple inspirations for you guys to better understand this in the deeper context. So our step one is to identify the question. What we have to do scenario planning, we have to ask a question, for instance, how will the technological industry develop in the next five years that can affect internet banking for these particular services in China? This is a good kind of a question, but it's still not detailed enough. Just an example. So your question, when you when you ask this question, this certain requirement you have this your question has to fulfill. For first requirement is you have to be time based. If you guys know about smart goal, you know when you are, when you are co uh, constructing a smart goal, you have to know what have to be the goal has to be time based, isn't it? So you can't ask a trend like in the, in the infinity years. You are uh, you are finding out uh, investigating for a particular trend. For instance, for five years. For instance, for ten years. There should be a certain trend. Okay, so, so there should be a certain time base. So it should be limited in time when you make this prediction. Second requirement is, it has to be clear in stakeholders. So who are the party of interest? Everybody may know internal and external stakeholders. Internal stakeholders basically managers, employees, and investors. External stakeholders may be the government, agencies, competitors, so on and so forth. So you have to investigate who are your stakeholders, and how will the stakeholders change? For instance, we're talking about investors. When we talk about investors, is your demand and perspectives in the future may change, isn't it? How will they apply investment decisions? This will link to how, as a company, if I'm the manager of a company, how can I satisfy my investor with a return? How can I satisfy the investor in the different from the past? Right? And how, what will the investors look at? Not only on my return, like a 77% return of the investor's investment, investors may look at different perspectives that me, my, me, uh, my company may have to review. 15 years ago, a company without risk management models may not be required for a bank for a bank to be successful and gain investment. But right now, we have to incorporate risk management uh, to uh, mathematical models to actually convince our investors that our services is stable. 
our services is capable of getting revenues in the near in the near future. So you guys should invest in my company. So this is what this is my point here. I hope you guys can grasp this point that I am just saying an example talking about investors is that the demand perspective. What are the investors looking at when they analyze your company may change over a year. This you can find out this trend if you analyze the last twenty years, last four to five decades. You can actually find there's this this kind of trend, right? There is this kind of trend that is existing. Okay, and a next example can be the government, which is an external shareholders that poses regulations to businesses. In the future, when economy develops, the company may. The government may post more regulations on renewable energy sources that you guys may have been thinking about. Now everybody knows we have to save the environment from global warming, and maybe and from greenhouse emissions, nitrogen oxide, uh, carbon dioxide gases emissions. So we have to try to reduce our production with assimilation with assimilation of renewable energy sources. We try to use more renewable energy sources instead of non-renewable energy sources, and the government may be able to post strict regulations in the future. Therefore, we may have to start innovating now. This is a good question. It's always linked to now. So for some trends, it doesn't have to link to now. For instance, if you are manufacturing business, you are manufacturing clothes, and you feel the labor, you are producing revenues. This labor is uh, cheap. Labor is saving you a lot of cost, and you are kind of a boosting. Uh, you have a stable business here, and you're planning to, uh, you are planning to develop new clothing. It's fine. For this case, you might not have to link the future trend to now. But for business like this, as I mentioned before, when for for a case of phenomenon like this, when the government may be able to post, they may post stricter regulations on non-renewable energy sources. You may have to link it to now because if you one day just replace your coal with sunlight, with solar energy, or with wind energy, it may cost you a lot of money. You might even go bankrupt. You might be not not be able to liquidify. This means now then you may have to uh, start innovating. Start from the beginning to use certain amount of money to actually gradually develop this kind of a renewable energy production model. So when your business become large, becomes big,、uh, and the government poses regulation, you are able to continue your production. You are able to keep up with efficiency to produce it fast along with so、uh, with along with solar and wind energy. So this is just an example. Another example on stakeholders can be employees' behaviors and efficiency. While the employees' behaviors change, more people may work from home. When, when, for example, as we can see from the COVID nineteen pandemic, when we want to gather talents from around the world, although、uh, COVID nineteen may cause a lot of negative effects, such as、uh, efficiency may decrease when we are conducting Zoom calls to、uh, de- delegate our task and work at home rather than work in the office, when we can discuss openly and brainstorm ideas and spark our decisions. But some companies find that, for example,、uh, which、uh, from a conversation I discussed with the Wharton faculty, the person actually told me the Wharton faculty actually operates his own business in medical biology. He actually told me that sometimes it is better even to have employees work at home because then they are able to gather talent from around the world. They don't have to pay their flights to go to the states. It may be someone in Russia, maybe someone in Beijing, maybe someone in United Kingdom, maybe someone in Singapore, someone in Thailand, someone in Malaysia. So sometimes we can think about these behaviors. How can these behaviors change? We can think about this in a micro and macro impacts、uh, and macro aspects. For instance, just now I talk about、uh, I talk about virtual working, which means some people can work in across continents, and there may be a micro mic macro a start with a macro behavior. But there can also be micro behavior within a company. For instance, in the future, technology may assist employees' behaviors, while employees change his way of work. Well, the tasks change. If there is a change, well, if there is any replacement of technology in our workforce, maybe we have to ch- completely change our business model, in terms of how we serve the customers, and also we have to change our internal business model in terms of how we conduct our work every day, how we work every day. A simple example can be teachers used to be go to school and go to the whiteboard and meet up the teachers in the meeting room to discuss the exams. They come up with the questions, but now as now. People, you guys may know, you guys are doing Zoom calls across uh, uh, all over the world. You know that now the teachers just wake up at home, they set up a Zoom call, they set up exam papers on their computers, they discuss with their department,、uh, department leader, with their colleagues, teachers on Zoom call. So this is an example, but this example is pretty simple because there's not large impacts. Teachers still work just like the normal days since teachers in school also use the laptop to work often. But for a business such as a medical biology business, when you are working. Maybe if the if the technology can play a certain part, you might have to make some workers redundant. You might have to change your concentration of finance. 
on your spending, the proportion of the spending of your budget. Before you may spend 30% of your budget in a budget in analysis, but now you have the robots do the work for you. Maybe you spend this 30% of budget in marketing, 30% of budget in talent search. I don't know. So this, I just want to give you an idea with this. They want to tell you guys that behaviors will change. And same for the efficiency. I don't have to go too far, too, down, uh, too deep down into efficiency. Just like robots can work faster, Sometimes our workflow can be faster with application of certain thing. Maybe internet banking. Now people can apply for loan services just by uh, just by asking questions online, just by entering information online, and possibly enter verification such as fin number, uh, such as fin number of Singapore, such as passport number online. They can apply a loan online. Don't have to go to your branch. How will that impact the rental fee? So now you are kind of like uh, you can brainstorm a lot of problems interconnected to a certain factor. And now, lastly, we may also have new business model and methodologies for certain occupation. For some occupations, just a simple example, now teachers use computers. Before teachers don't. Now teachers have whiteboard that they can project certain PPT, they can project a PowerPoint, they can show students a video before they cannot. Right? They could not. So this is just a simple example, but in the future, methodologies well change and this is this goes along importantly in scenario planning in terms of the future trends. So methodology, just like Zoom, we may Zoom and we may coordinate with in the supply chain. As a my interest research in the supply chain, we may coordinate with other partners of our supply chain using online devices. We may we may be able to complete online payment. We may be we may be developing crowdfunding. We may be developing online financial services that that is not as easy as you think, like paying a hot dog in the park with your phone. Because that would be because that methodology, if we transfer banking physical in the physical branch to your banking in internet, in banking in, on the internet, there are a lot of regulations needed, a lot of processes needed, a lot of contracts needed, a lot of system requirements needed. So it, the methodology sheet could be highly difficult, right? So this is pretty important. Now, moreover, we have to talk about compromising between different stakeholders for mutual benefits. So we have pressure groups versus shareholders. Possibly shareholders want to earn more money. So they don't really care about the environmental effect, but may, there may be an environmental agency, or this can be the pressure group, or maybe the pressure group is a trade union. They don't want the workers to work too long. They don't want the company to produce too much uh, greenhouse emissions, but the shareholders doesn't care. The shareholders just care about the share return. So in this case, you have to compromise. Sometimes stakeholders can have conflict because shareholders can be internal and external, and usually the case is internal and external stakeholders have a complex together. This is what happens most commonly, right? This is a part, this is a conflict that is hardest to compromise, that is hardest to compromise, right? Here's what we have to consider. An environment agency may be may verse supply chain partners. Supply chain partners may be, uh, may be able to, co they may want to coordinate. They also care about profits like the shareholders. Well, environmental, well environment agencies may add more pressures in terms of a way more pressures in terms of a pollution, things like that. So then the third requirement is your question has to be relevant and important. For instance, you have to ask these questions, four questions below. Is your question re relevant to your industry? Is it relevant to your market? Does it affect your market, for instance? Does it affect your business model? Does it affect how your market works? Does it affect how your supply chain will, kept, will be conducted? In what ways will a particular change impact your business? And can I trace back this trend to now, just like I mentioned before? If so, what actions can I do at the moment right now? So here, important questions. And now we finish with our step one. Here's our step one, okay? In this video, we'll continue until step three. Okay, so step two, now let's go on to step two, is to examine the space. What do I mean by space? Space is basically the trend, basically the space of the trend, how will your trend be carried out? And what will the trend be posited in the future? What's the position of the trend? What's the position of the scenario? For instance, the space can be technology, space can be internet banking, the space can be a pandemic, like now, the space can be pandemic, the space can be inflation, the space can be trade war, the space can be a globalized issue, can be a war, even like that. So now, in, in the particular step, in step two, you have to develop a scanning skill that many of you, students, you and me, may already have these skills. So everybody now uses Instagram, you use Twitter, you use Facebook, and although you might be using it to follow celebrities, but you may also use it in the positively point of view, that you may use it to help you develop new knowledge that can help you to see the trend of the future. 
if we do not have YouTube, I may not understand that the future can evolve so fast that technology can replace manufacturing in the blink of an eye. I may not know that if I don't watch YouTube, if I don't read articles from the Business Times, I may even not, I, I may not know that um, the self-driving cars may emerge pretty fast. Maybe the next decade, self-driving cars can emerge in the next five, five years, next 10 years, they may emerge pretty fast. So scanning skill is important and that can be done by RWA. So you have to ask the question, why does something happen and why doesn't? Why does technology evolve so fast? Why does, why does many companies now acquire just-in-time inventory? Why are companies now applying this particular strategy in the supply chain? Why are the companies applying pull strategy and pull strategy in the supply chain? Or why doesn't it? Doesn't? Okay, so now we have to train absorptive capacity, capacity. This capacity is pretty broad. Some students already have it. Like I say, you and me may already have some certain capacities of the training absorptive capacity, but definitely it can be pretty complex. Capacity doesn't only mean that you are identifying a trend just by looking at some news. You may, it can also be detailed. It can also be pretty detailed like internet banking regulations, government regulations, or the political impact on your businesses and the environmental, political, and um, social impacts, right? So it can be pretty complex. And now I want, to, want, I want to emphasize how you can train this scanning skill is through reading, watching, and asking. So for reading, you can read trade journals, you can go to forums where people do discuss a lot of stuff. You can also go to webinars where you can usually meet people of your same occupation, or you can meet experts as a student, or as a work, working person, you can meet experts in certain fields. Like, like Walton Forums, I suggest you guys to join Walton Forums, which are highly useful. And also business reviews and news. I don't want to emphasize too much on the example. It can be patents, research essays written by uh, students, written by professors, lecturers. Watching. You can watch videos by experts in individual fields. You can also ask industry experts, analyze professors and researchers on how will this field evolve. Not, you, of course, you may know the large trend, but I mentioned before, the future distributes in small quantities. This means sometimes you're not able to see the future de in, in, lar in greater detail. But where you can find the greater detail, where you can find the interconnection between different industries, between different factors, you have to consult certain experts. The experts can be someone already working in the industry. It can be some professors who are conducting regular research, especially they conduct research along with different businesses. It's pretty helpful. Okay, So this is what I want to discuss right now. For example, you can find out how well changes in the business will impact your career over the next 10, 5 to 10 years. Maybe the number of lawyers by 2030 will decrease because now we can use robots to record uh, to record what's spoken by was spoken by the crime criminal and we can analyze using particular uh, using the laptop, using artificial intelligence that stores all the jurisdictions, and they can analyze who uh, analyze the crime and and they will give and indicate the crime for a particular criminal. And maybe physical stores will experience a decrease in popularity. You guys already know that many stores are moving online. You see Taobao, you see Tmall, you see, you see a, um, Amazon, you see eBay, people buying online. And financial analysts are no longer needed. It is possible. People like me are dreaming to be an investment banker, but it might not be the case in the future where we can use artificial intelligence to perform more efficiently. And maybe human in that case will be only required in larger levels such as client relationship, account management, and other risk management at work. But maybe we don't need financial analysts. I don't know, it can be the case. Okay, so here's our step two. In step two, we want to go into more detail because when we are in step two, our goal is to examine the space, to find out the trend. But when we are finding out, investigating the trend, we have to find out some fundamental questions. We have to find out the answers from some fundamental questions in order to build the trend. Of course, there can be many, many questions. You can brainstorm it and you can uh, submit your ideas below. But I want to focus on these six questions. The first question I want to ask is, where are people living in the future right now? This sentence may seem a, bit, a little bit messy, but it actually means, so it actually means when you imagine the future, there may be people working in different occupations, where are they working now? For instance, what are the jobs that will alter in the future and what jobs and skills are these people developing or working at the moment, right now, 2020? For instance, FinTech, financial technology, there's a combination of implementation of a technology into financial services. These experts may be applying information management maybe applying programming, they may be applying data engineering to enable AI banking in the future. So if you predict that in the future there can be AI banking, you can refer it to right now, you can refer it to the present days, the fintech experts actually may be developing this particular thing. And as a business or as a banking uh, worker, as a banking manager, you have to take account of this when you're doing scenario planning. The second question guys is, who has been working directly and indirectly in this space? 
So we have to apply data, use data to identify if there are any trend and how will these participants impact the industry. For instance, artificial intelligence, there may be people who are developing it directly or indirectly people may be putting into effort that we don't know. So we have to use data, we have to ask experts. Remember asking, watching and uh, asking, watching, reading. We try to do investigating and we try to stay. If we have to also do this work right now. Uh, and if so, we, are we working directly or indirectly in this space? Do we employ someone to work directly or indirectly in this space? Many questions to ask, right? And the third one, third question is, who has been funding or enabling this space at the moment? So for instance, you have to consider trends in the past, we learn from our history, and we have to see if there's possible changes in the future or in terms of the funders enablers who can actually incubate, who can actually achieve our business. Okay, so for instance, the growing popularity of crowdfunding, if you're a student from the United States watching this video right now as a classmate of the Walden uh, program, or you're just some audience, you may know Kickstarter. Kickstarter is or Indiegogo, the two United States crowdfunding businesses that have been emerging fast in the recent years. These two businesses are examples of crowdfunding. Now we do not require large businesses uh, to fund as particular business, and we do not require large businesses to, pump, to fund potential businesses and get and for them to get profits only. Now individuals can fund in smaller quantities. For instance, can be just hundred dollars, and they can get prop uh, again certain profits as well in small pieces of cake. And now we're also enabling in this crowdfunding way with Kickstarter or Indiegogo. We're enabling, we're allowing more smaller businesses to emerge. That is actually pretty optimistic for our society and for our market as a whole, if you're a government agency. It's pretty optimistic, right? So this is an example. And the second example can be government subsidies. Well, you raise a job. How will you work? You can analyze this and predict this government subsidy aspect based on how is the economy working. If the economy is working bad, government may not have money, but the government may also impose certain subsidies. So you try to make this prediction to see whether this is possible and will this trend be possible to, to be implemented in the businesses and how will it affect me? Am I able to get the subsidy? How will it affect my competitor? So this is, can be another example. You can also talk about individual investors. How will, what will they see? Just like this question I asked in our question one, what are the demand and perspectives of investors? They are funding and enabling this space. What elements are they looking for? They, they will, what elements are they looking for that can, they can construct a successful attractiveness for them to construct a certain attraction for them to invest in our particular business? Right? Okay, the third question we want to, the fourth question we want to ask is who will be impacted by the space? So we have to consider the pros and cons, which means some people will be possibly impacted, like technology do increase efficiency, but some negative. Some people, many people lose their jobs, especially those factory workers, those low skill workers that specialize in manufacturing, those sweatshop workers, these workers working. So how well the who, those people infected, impact my business? Will they impact my business? Always make this link back to your business. And is talent search, and how will it impact the talent search and my business models? Good questions to ask. Maybe my talent search have to change. Because some people will be affected, they are no longer needed. They are the, the positions now, the positions, the occupations in our company that we're having right now will be made redundant in the future, not longer needed. And my business model may also have to change internally and externally. Maybe some participants are not needed anymore. Maybe my model, my services have to change as well since many people are affected. For instance, an affected party can be customer. Customer shopping through Amazon. So now my business model have to change. I have to move my sale, part of sale, not only on physical store, Adidas, for instance, have to sell shoes on Amazon or the internet platform as well because they want to change the business model to shape, to suit what's impacted, to suit the impacts of the technology and internet development on customers. And the fifth question I want to ask is who is trying to stop this from happening? You have to consider in this case the reason for stopping and will this kind of attempts cause any impacts. So for instance, some people may stop, so some people may want to stop technology development. They think you'll lose your job. They think they're not capable of implementing them into a business. It may be too costly. Will this attempt cause impact to me? Does that mean I will have to continue physical stores for a longer time? Or does it mean no? Or does it mean if nobody's stopping this, does it mean I have to also follow up the trend, follow up, the, follow up with the scenario, right? Last question, who might see this as a business opportunity? Consider why there opportunity for these people. For instance, banking, for instance, technology, for instance, people, uh, people, uh, people selling Amazon. These people benefit for technology development. And if you link to COVID-19 or just government regulations, some people do benefit from that, some people don't. 
and my business one of them. If I'm my business one of them, how can I benefit them? What action to take now? Link back. Moreover, if I don't benefit it, how can I get benefits from this business that benefit it? How can I cooperate with them? How can I provide benefits to these businesses that are benefited from this opportunity? So I can get certain benefits, and the business who is benefited from this business opportunity can also get some benefit from me. Sorry for the logic. So basically means if I'm able to benefit from this space, work hard, put in efforts to benefit. If not, I'll try to well, I'll try to go see these people, these people who do benefit from these opportunities, and I'll try to cooperate with them. Okay? So this is a question to ask. Okay, after asking these fundamental questions and examining the trend in the future and make certain predictions, now we have to actually identify the trend after we've been examining the space. So we have to conduct trend analysis. So the trend analysis will be something like you're looking for a trend which is a source of sustained change in society. This is sustained change. That's not a smaller change like my mom will eat a cake in the next two hours. I'm hungry, so it's probably uh, my father will spend twenty dollars to buy hamburger. Those are not sustained change. Today he might buy the hamburger, tomorrow he may buy rice. Right? Tomorrow he might not be so hungry as today. So we're looking to looking for a trend that's sustainable in our society. That means it's long term driven, like at least five to ten years. We might predict the five to ten years, but our trend may have to go in the future, hundreds of years. For instance, I want to clear up something is when we identify a trend, we're not identifying just COVID. But we're identifying what would COVID unleash in the future. And we try to analyze this trend with a state model that I'm going to introduce to you right now. So state model, for, we have to take account of STEEP. So this model is particularly important in your scenario planning while students work through a case study where they try to uh, analyze and try to drop down STEEP uh, for, the, uh, for a particular case, okay? So social, on the social aspect, people have to take account of values. Demography, consumer behaviors. This is how consumer behaviors will change. Especially when we have to talk about in different places. For instance, in the United States, we have 50 states. How will this change? How will this alter? How are people different in different states in terms of consumer consu consumption behavior, in terms of purchasing power? And also values as well. Technology, technological is the second point. Like the innovations, life cycle for product, research and development, how will it change? What time will it change? How will efficiency change? How much time can you save? Economical the willingness to buy in the microeconomic factors. How will customer buy and how can government regulations change the certain trend in the future? How will that affect private institutions, private businesses? Environment as well. And this is pretty much linked to politics, which is, can be food, water, uh, uh, energy and pollution and politics, stability, regulation, trade. Sometimes regulations are placed to impose special and they're targeted at environmental effects. They're targeted at environmental issues. This, this is what I, what I mean, environment and politics do correlate together. Okay, so this is my explanation on the steep model. Okay, so although it is easy to explain, but you know, STEP as I mentioned before, they can be interconnected. They are hinged all together. So when you talk about politics, it may, it may simply affect economics, environment, technology, and customer behavior. Economics can, can influence consumer behavior, technology as well. And politics can influence economic behavior, they can influence consumer behavior. So they are linked. You can draw a lot of lines to them. Right? When you post a tax, it can influence consumer behaviors. The consumer behaviors can also influence what the further actions to take, policies to impose, blah blah blah. So remember the state model and all this part are interconnected. Okay. So now we finish with our first three steps. In the next step, uh, in the next step, I'm going to be talking about how to build a scenario instead of planning. So we're pretty much finished with this video right now, and I'll continue to be writing about scenario scenarios. I'm continue writing about uh, step four and five on building scenarios, and taking a brief recap. Our main goal is we have actually identified the principle. We're able to actually understand why do we do scenario planning, the purpose of it, the goal of it, and how it's carried out kind of the the sense of scenario planning. We focus on the shareholder, where we impl uh, examine the space, where we ask certain questions, and where we identify the trend. Okay. Although I know it's, too, uh, it's still a bit vague because we are taking this as a lesson, but when we implement into your business, it, there can be a lot of work to do. Although there can be a lot of confusion, a lot of complexity, a lot of coordinations required, but when we implement these steps into the business, it is a long-term process to even just do this scenario planning. So a business, what does it have to do is try to compromise between planning and present. 
So they may plan for future trend, but they also have to operate right now, gradually feed in the future trend while they're able to generate the optimal profits at the moment. Just like COVID-19, businesses may be, may, may be thinking of if the virus gets even severe, if the virus gets ba better or gets better, so maybe if it gets worse, they have to implement just-in-case inventory. They may have to uh, develop VPN, they may have to develop a new business model. But, what, but at the moment, they have to also feed and also make profit whatever they can. And some people may think the COVID-19 may get better, so they have to kind of try to transfer this back to the physical physical business model, Physi uh, in terms of physical customer interactions, office work, and a physical education, uh, like physical education physically inside a classroom as well. So business have to, what does it have to do is try to compromise between prediction, between planning for the future and now. Although they can link together, but for example, manufacturing business may not have to implement technology right now. They can still pr produce and fix and kind of a develop and optimize what they're able to profit right now and at the same time in the meantime they can try to develop for the future try to implement certain strategies try to implement work try to put in the effort for future technological development so okay guys thank you for uh, watching this video today i know it may be a little bit tedious sorry for that because actually scenario planning is interesting but when you are discussing it by yourself it's interesting but when you are looking at lesson you it may be a uh, pretty hard to assimilate this information in um, hope you guys can grasp some insights from this video and uh, thank you guys very much and the next video I'm going to be continuing discussing the steps of scenario planning and um, we'll discuss a lot more about how to predict the future okay guys thank you very much if you have any questions please comment below or you can um, you can also look up more information from Walton professor's research paper if you go to the Walton Business School's official website okay so I'll see you there bye